the Division of Medical, uh, Division of Medicine, sorry, Center for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine. And so this is my second meeting as chair of the SMS board. Uh, thanks for coming this afternoon. I'm, I'm, I've only got a couple of uh, things to say before we get things properly underway. So the first thing to say is that I'm happy to, to announce that we soon have a dedicated website uh, for, for, for the board and for board business. Jenny, can you show that slide, please? Uh, so as you'll see, as a start at least, it's gonna contain contact details for me as chair and Jenny as secretary. Uh, and we welcome um, um, emails on board business um, offline. Uh, it's gonna have the minutes. Uh, I think you'll have to uh, follow a link to SharePoint for that. Um, it's got the agenda item submission form, which I talked about at the last meeting, and that's for proposing um, any matter that an individual or a group wants to, um, wants to table for pre-circulation um, and debate at a, um, at, a, at a board meeting. And we've also got a new uh, school board question submission form. Um, that's something that you can just submit anytime you want, really up to the day of, uh, of the meeting. Uh, and you can submit it with or without a name and you could submit it um, to me um, or to, uh, to Jenny and we'll feed that into uh, the discussion at the appropriate point in the agenda. So I wanna thank Jenny for um, putting this together um, and we obviously welcome any suggestions that any, any of you might have about other items uh, that you'd like to see on this site to improve it. Uh, so for today and for future meetings, we obviously encourage members to submit uh, questions in real time through the Zoom chat function. And if you want to do this anonymously, you need to ch change your Zoom name uh, when you're now, when you join the meeting. And you can do that by clicking on your name in the participant area and renaming yourself, either with your username or even as anonymous. Um, since our last meeting, we did receive a few questions and requests from members of the board, and I'm going to take those up at the appropriate um, session, at the appropriate slot in today's meeting. Uh, so that's all from me for the time being. So, Tony, can I ask you to go ahead with your school update, please? I thought it was David first. <clears throat> yes. Oh, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. <laughs> David, sorry, David. Policy yeah. and procedures. Yeah, so as at the start of every school board, um, it falls upon me to read out the um, statement on policy and procedure of contracts of employment. Um, so apologies, I'm looking to one side, I'm just looking at my other screen. Uh, the information below is provided to the school board in line with university policy and procedure on contracts of employment in order that it may provide feedback if it wishes to the university staffing committee, which meets around four times a year to consider proposals for dismissal of staff on fixed term or finite funded contracts due to redundancy. In line with the policy, collective consultation takes place regularly with the trade unions and at a local level, individual consultation takes place. The consult consultations include seeking ways to avoid dismissals and reducing the numbers of employees to be dismissed. In this school for the period of October 2020 to March 2021, there are currently 42 members of staff on either fixed term or permanent contracts whose funding is of a finite duration and who are therefore at risk of redundancy at the conclusion of their contract of employment. As indicated above, through collective consultation and individual consultation between the members of staff and their line managers, efforts are being made to seek further funding or redeployment opportunities in order to avert the consequences of redundancy. It should also be noted that most of the staff who are at risk of redundancy and who wish to continue working at the university are successfully retained in employment. If the school board wishes to make any comments, these should be submitted by the chair to the head of human resources in the first instance. Okay, that's me. 
Okay. Um, that's cheerful. Um, <clears throat> Tony. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> um, and thank you to everybody else that's um, attending this board meeting. I have no prior knowledge as to how popular we are compared with the other schools, but I know from looking at the names that it's um, a forum which I enjoy attending just because there are so many colleagues and friends that come to our particular meetings. I'm also conscious that we have guests um, uh, with Patrick and Gabrielle attending. It's far more important from a board perspective uh, that uh, we address questions uh, that are posed by members of the school via the chair, Ian, um, and rather than um, you listening to a sermon from the head of school. So <clears throat> in reverse order, um, I guess that we'll talk about uh, teaching delivery through Gabrielle, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome her uh, to talk to us about it in these extraordinary times. With regard to the estate, um, you'll be aware of the, the, the issues. Uh, some of our estate on the campus is open, some of it is not. There may be the campus management group will be revisiting what we can and can't do over the next few weeks, uh, but I'll obviously keep you informed as I'm a member of, of that particular uh, grouping. Um, with regard to the current situation in Manchester, <clears throat> Uh, we haven't quite reached the peak of cases yet. It's pretty grim in the hospital at the moment, uh, but in for, the, the upside is that perhaps not as many patients are going into intensive care uh, and that we are looking after them on the general wards. But we anticipate that we are at the peak now and in another couple of weeks, uh, we hope that Greater Manchester will be past the peak and on the way down. And hopefully with vaccination coming in, this will be the beginning of the end, but we've seen that before. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed. Um, uh, the only other thing to signal to you generically across our school is, as you are aware from a research perspective, um, we have been threatened by uh, the reduction in charity funding. Uh, it has yet to have a full impact upon us but most funding bodies appear to be alive to the issues that will be raised by wholesale cuts and are being resourceful um, about the way they continue to fund research across the UK in the various disciplines that they supply support. Uh, and at the moment, um, I'm not aware of too many problems. Uh, I'm not making light of the situation. It may get worse before it gets better, but SMS is not in a bad place just yet. And that's all I'm gonna say at this moment. I'm happy to take questions, or I know we've got the question and answer session at the end. Uh, we can uh, reserve more time for Patrick and Gabrielle, Ian, but I'm happy to take any issues that there, there may be at this moment. <clears throat> um, okay, thank you, Tony. Um, are there any immediate questions uh, on the basis of what Tony just said, or? As he said, we can take questions generally um, at the end at the end of the meeting. I don't see anybody. I don't see anything in the chat room. Jen, okay. do you see anything? No. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Well then, ahead of schedule, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Patrick, <laughs> who's the registrar, as you know, and secretary and chief operating officer of the university. Uh, thank you for attending this meeting, Patrick over to you. Okay, great, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to um, some, spend some time with you all today. I hope you're all keeping, keeping well. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about reshaping PS. Um, I've got four slides that I'm going to share on the screen, if that's okay with everyone. Um, uh, they, we, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go through the slides fairly quickly. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions um, either as we go along or, or at the end. Um, so, okay, so, so to start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the internal context, a little bit about external context and external benchmarking, a bit about our approach, and then a bit about opportunities and, and challenges. So much of this you, you will already 
I guess, recognize, you know, uh, um, across uh, our university, we, we see, you know, every year a, a growing appetite for, for higher quality services across everything that we do in professional services. And that's um, uh, understandable. And it's certainly our ambition to deliver very high quality, um, agile services to, to, to colleagues right across the university, to all our stakeholders, students internally, staff internally, but also to external partners and stakeholders, statutory bodies and um, um, other partners that we work with. Uh, you're all familiar with the, the recent voluntary severance scheme um, last year, uh, where we saw a significant reduction in NPS staffing numbers across the university. That has uh, inevitably presented some challenges and pinch points for us um, in the short term. Uh, our plan through SEP and other reshaping programs is to be able to change the way we do things to help us be able to deliver high quality services um, uh, with, with uh, few, fewer colleagues, in, uh, I guess is the shortcut way of thinking about that. Um, we might come back to that again um, in a moment. Um, there are obviously risks that uh, costs will creep back. We see this, see this year on year in the university. We're no different to many others. We don't have a very rigid workforce plan uh, and so costs do tend to creep back in. Sometimes that's quite legitimate whether our increased student numbers. Um, in other cases, it's, it's, it's not um, as, as justified. We also have, as part of the current context, you know, a significant in-flight range of programs. Many technology heavy SEP to student experience programs are really good example of that. Um, but one thing that we're, we're really very clear about is that wherever we undertake change in the university, we want to do that through uh, full and meaningful engagement um, and consensus building with colleagues, professional and academic colleagues across our, our university and indeed with our student stakeholders through, through the students' union. And, and I'll talk about that again. Um, we've seen, haven't we, over the past 10 uh, months or so with the pandemic, we've seen very many challenges, but equally we've seen real opportunities for how we might do things differently in the university. Remote working is a, a, a very good example of that. Um, we've also got other change programs like the ME, uh, MECD project, which is a huge opportunity for us to rethink how we do things um, in the university. On the other side of the coin, of course, we're, we, we're always managing with constrained resources and constrained investment. Uh, and that's really more acute now than it's been in, in many years. We're coming to the end of a, of a major investment program across the university. Uh, much of that is going into our, our IT systems. But we need to maintain that uh, investment if we can. That's a key component and enabler to delivering um, change. You know, the, MEC, the student experience program is a 40 million pound plus investment. Um, our finance transformation program is 10 million plus. Um, so change doesn't come cheaply, uh, particularly if you want to do it well. Uh, and as you see with the student experience program now, the amount of engagement that we undertake and the uh, number of colleagues, professional and academic that we use to engage with the program to support us to deliver design and deliver the program does it does it does a cost to that and it's real sometimes it's an opportunity cost but it's an important component to delivering change in a, in a meaningful um, way and of course we're always operating with a, a, a moving target aren't we um, uh, the circumstances we operate in change. Um, the, there's more and more pressure to be more flexible and agile than maybe we have been in, in how we do things in, in the past. Um, there's a lot of detail on this slide, and so uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, we we're, I can share the slides with you afterwards, Ian, if you'd like to circulate them to, to colleagues for them to have a look at. And I'm very happy afterwards if anybody wants to drop me a line with any questions. But there's, there's kind of four messages in this slide. This is a slide benchmarking us against other similar universities um, in, in the Russell Group and some international peers as well. And it shows us that our professional services costs as a percentage of the turnover of our university are our average relative to our peer group in that top left graph. 
Um, uh, so we're, we're not an outlier, we're not very expensive and we're not very cheap either. Um, so that, that's reassuring. But of course, we're comparing ourselves to other similar institutions. And one of the things we want to do is challenge ourselves in professional services to see whether we can be best in sector and take, take best practice from other sectors that could help us um, deliver our uh, higher quality services in, in the university. Um, in the top right uh, graph, you can see that the proportion of our activities that directly support our core goals, again, is not out of line with our peer group. But I would, on that graph, what I would pick out from there is that the investment we make in change is relatively modest. And giving, given our ambitions for change across professional services, I, I think that's not uh, going to be sufficient to deliver it. Now, to create more investment for our change program, we need to create that, we need to free up that headroom from, from somewhere else in, in our operations. And then if you look at the bottom left uh, graph, that shows us that we have a very large number of distinct services that are variously distributed right around the university. Um, that inevitably leads to, to complexity and, and does um, drive cost as well. So it shows us that if we can um, find more ways to be more agile and efficient, we can, we can help to reduce our costs across the university. And then in the bottom right, uh, what this graph is showing us is that the sector as a whole, actually, and we're right in the middle of this, is, is characterized by a high proportion of, of manual work. Uh, we have a lot of colleagues, um, you know, sharing spreadsheets, not a lot of work is automated, uh, many times work has to be handled a number of times before it gets to where it needs to be. And very often we find ourselves and we'll all have experienced this with data where we're not clear which, which data um, represents the actual position. Um, uh, that's true where we try and count FTEs as well as counting, counting finance. So that puts pressure on us for the longer term as well. So in terms of our approach to, to reshaping professional services, we will obviously be reviewing the whole portfolio uh, and looking to, to pursue benefits right across everything that we do. And those benefits are not just uh, about financial efficiency. They are also about improving the quality of what we do, make sure that it's appropriate and fit for purpose um, in, each, in each school and each part of the university. As I've said before, uh, and we have a steering group that has academic and PS colleagues who are seeing this work now, we're really committed to co-creating solutions um, for the design of our services in the future. This is not something that will be done to the university. We will work with academic and PS colleagues um, to co-create the service models for the future. And we will continue as we're doing with the student experience program to align technology with process, with structures. I think in the past, we've been guilty of focusing on one over the others, um, whereas really successful change requires us to marry technology, process and structures um, uh, in a neat way together, in, a, in an integrated way. That adds to the cost of the change program, but ultimately, it produces more successful outcomes. Also, um, we are adopting an organizational development approach to skills and the development of colleagues across professional services aligned with clear workforce planning. This is really important. This is about um, a focus on people, ensuring they have the skills and the development support to be able to do their, their fulfill their roles as well as they would want to. Um, we will also challenge this, those structural issues that I mentioned earlier. You know, in some cases, we have a very large management overhead. We have a very significant reliance on manual interventions, and we'll be looking to stream, streamline those as we go along. Uh, and reviewing how we do transactional services will be an important part of that work. Um, the shape, we need to shape the program to reflect our capacity. What this is really a, means is twofold. Uh, we need to work within the financial resources that we have available to us, but equally, we need to work with the capacity that colleagues have across the university to engage with change whilst at the same time doing the day job. 
uh, and that you know, particularly over the last 10 months, that has been a very real challenge for everybody when the day job has become more challenging with more uncertainty. Uh, and we've seen, say, with the student experience programme, that that has had to slow down in order to allow colleagues to focus more on, on the day job than, than on SEP itself. Now that's beginning to pick up again, uh, and there'll be more about that in the weeks to come. Um, we're also not setting out with a very clear end point in mind. That's partly because this will come from the co-creation of the solutions. It's also a reflection that there's no such thing as an end point. You know, we, we want to have services that are flexible and agile all the time that, that can respond to need or to new developments internally or outside the university. So there's no such thing really as as, as an end point. We want to be able to operate on, a, on the basis of continuous improvement throughout all of our work. And then finally, um, we thinking about opportunities and challenges. The opportunity for us is to think about our service end to end uh, rather than just thinking about departmental boundaries that enables us to look at how we deliver services from the perspective of a, mem of a member of staff or from a student they're less concerned about where things happen and more about how quickly and how efficiently and how, how, what the quality is of that service. And so looking at our processes from end to end uh, uh, focuses our minds in that area. I've already talked about embedding skills uh, and the culture of ongoing challenge and change. Uh, the world that we're now operating in is clearly very uncertain that's unlikely to change in the, in the short to medium term. And so we need our colleagues to be uh, feel that they have the support um, and resources to be able to operate uh, in that sort of environment. And the skills development program is a clear, a clear component of that. Also, our estate utilisation and new ways of working that we've learned through the past 10 months will play a really important part in how we design our services for the future. You know, the... The, the, the experience we've had through remote working probably means that we will never have all of our staff on campus uh, at the same time in the future. That will have an impact on how we work and, and on our plans for the future estate strategy. Um, finally, on challenges, well, the scale of what we're doing is very significant. Um, there's no example across the sector of an institution who have successfully delivered a program of, of this scale, and we're very conscious of that, um, but we believe that the way we're approaching it will give us the best chance of, of success. Um, I've already said that there are issues around resourcing the program, creating the investment headroom um, to deliver the program. That's something that we will, we will look at as part of uh, uh, how we program the timetable for changes over the next three to five years. We also need to make sure, as I've said before, that we can deliver the change program whilst managing our day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities as well. That's a really important uh, consideration. And it was, as I've said already, uh, a very clear constraint on us during the, the current year that we've experienced the pandemic. Ina, I'll pause there if that's okay. Hopefully I've gone through it reasonably quickly, but I'm really happy to take um, questions. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you, Patrick. And, and yes, please, if you could send those slides either to me or to Jenny as um, the board secretary, we'll put that up, they'll put them up on the, um, on the site when it's, when it's available to us. Um, so I should check to see whether there are any immediate questions for you on the chat uh, line. Um, uh, there aren't, so I'll take a, um, a punt um, as a, and take a chair of privilege. And so I'm, I'm kind of um, in trying to sort of channel my inner um, Radio 4 presenter um, self here. So I'm asking you a question, not so much about what it is that you've presented, but just um, for you as a member of, of SLT who um, are joining us today. And I'm asking this for my information as the new chair of the board and also on behalf of board members who may wanna know 
whether coming to these um, uh, meetings and participating in discussions on university-wide matters um, is really worth their time. So the, the question is, um, again, as a member of um, this, the university senior leadership team, do you have, can you tell us what your view of the role and the, the, um, the significance of school boards is specifically um, if a board, any board in the university after a debate passes a resolution that takes a collective view on an aspect of university management policy or practice, uh, is it your view that this should and will be given time uh, for substantive discussion by university SLT? And also, would you think that a written response um, ought to be produced for board members, um, basically summarizing the consideration that the uh, resolution um, was given? Uh, that, that's a that's a, a a classic Radio Four question, Ian. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'll 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 try and, and do justice to that. I, I think the short the short answer is is um, is yes. Of course, we would and we do. Um, we have a don't we a very complex governance model in the university, um, and it, it, it you know it works from our board through through senate through faculty committees through school boards, um, uh, as well as running down through the, the line management through uh, SLT, faculty deans, heads of school, um, and division and, and other heads. It's quite a, quite a complex um, governance model that we have in our university. Uh, in many cases, uh, the, the role of the school board is a really important point of understanding uh, the feelings and views of staff in the university. Um, and there's a role for the school board to feed into the faculty committees and to feed feed into Senate. Um, and I'm sure you're aware that through Senate, we very often have uh, uh, discussions um, about resolutions from school boards. Very often they're in the form of a, of a motion. Um, I, I can't think of, a, of an occasion where there hasn't been consideration of uh, any of those resolutions, Ian, um, you, you might be able to light me if there were any. Um, if, uh, has there been written responses from SLT to, to school boards? I don't know whether I can vouch for, for, for that, um, but I'm sure that if they're not written, there's feedback th through other routes, through the deans, through heads of school, or directly from SLT members where, where that's appropriate. Okay, uh, thanks. I mean, I uh, was answering your question. No, sure. I mean, it, it is. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, the, the, the question for me is, is not one for the past, but actually one for the future and uh, what we might be able to expect if the, if the, if the board uh, sort of reaches a conclusion that it wants to um, sort of feed into SLT. And I suppose what we can do is we can request a response and see, um, and see how that um, see how that goes. Uh, so thank thank you uh, very much for that. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, one is about uh, is about the agility uh, is about your your presentation. How does the centralized budgetary control adopted by the university facilitate agility at the local level uh, within schools of the university? Yeah, um, so that's a really good question, Ed. I, I don't know whether that's a general feeling you have or whether it's related to the past 10 months, because we've certainly seen, haven't we, through the pandemic, that there's been a tightening up of control on expenditure throughout the university. And that's, I don't make any apologies for that. I think that was inevitable with the financial uncertainties that we faced at the time and that we still face within the university. Um, but that's not the way in which we would normally want to operate. Um, we would want to have a clear financial framework uh, within which uh, directorates, faculties and schools have the freedom to make the right decisions um, locally in pursuit of our, of our objectives and our, our core goals. Um, there'll always be an element of central oversight because we have to make sure that, there's, that, that overall 
the institution achieves its, its certainly its financial targets, but that should facilitate at the same time significant um, autonomy locally. And I would say, it may not feel like this all the time, but I would say in our university, uh, I see more devolved um, decision-making and budgetary control than many other institutions that I'm familiar with. Uh, so yes, it, it didn't reflect the last 10 months, but so when do we have an indication that this may be released, uh, I think is where I'm getting... Ah, getting uh, well, okay, right. Well, well um, bad news on that front, Ed, because actually pre-Christmas, um, our plan in the new year was to free up more, more control. But what we're seeing now um, are further significant risks. We're seeing risks to um, haul rent income. Uh, we agreed a rent rebate last term. We've also now committed to not charging students for rent whilst they're not able to return to campus, which to us felt like the only right thing that we, we could do. And you'll be aware that there are uh, growing demands for tuition fee discounts as well. So actually we're, we're, we're concerned about the financial um, climate at the moment. So I, realistically, Ed, I think it'll be another few months before we can consider really going back to where we were in terms of financial control. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we've got, I, I hope you don't mind spending a couple more minutes with us. We've got three more questions lined up. Um, the first one is from Karsten. Yeah, I'm, I, didn't... I, I'm happy. Sorry, Karsten. I, I, I have got, I have got another half hour. So I'm, I'm more than happy, delighted really to stay with you for as long, as long as you, you need me. And then you can kick me out whenever you're ready. Okay. Sorry, Karsten. Sorry, I should have put it in the chat really but one one of the aspects i find rewarding of being about being on the faculty committee is that it includes representatives elected representatives from both ps and academic staff which is not the case in on senate so there is a bit of friction always when we communicate um, things that have been discussed on senate and and kind of try to align that with our remit on the faculty committee and what I find rewarding about it is that I hear about things that I learn about in the in the official communications, like the um, the, the student life cycle project, but which academics really generally don't understand. The, it, looking at the at the term, it isn't clear to most academics I know that this is actually a major restructuring program uh, for the for the PS. And this is, a, a, I found out, as I found out on the on faculty committee while talking to the PS representatives, this is a problem for PS colleagues because they can't communicate that to their academic colleagues. So I am concerned and keen, um, how could we make that more efficient? How could we build on these I, I think strong aspects of faculty committees, which we didn't have until until last year, and get that communication um, uh, uh, improved. Well, um, the the t t two things about that, um, and it relates to Ian's previous point as well. We, we are embarking on a governance review this year. Um, a major governance review from the board uh, and out through Senate um, and, its, and its committees. And there's an opportunity through that review, Karsten, to, to, to make your views known. Um, I obviously really endorse what you've said about the contribution that PS colleagues can make to, to discussion and debate. Um, what I found rather frustrating about the previous review of Senate was that the Senate decided that PS colleagues shouldn't automatically be members of school boards. Um, and, and that was, I think, a, I think that was a failing on our part, I have to say. Um, and I, I, hope, I hope that will be, be redressed through, through the next governance review. So do, do please make that, if that's your view, make that known okay. through, through, through the review. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Yes, I've, I've got a... Um, specific question, Patrick, in relation to um, the uh, research support, which was on one of the, um, the, the bars on your bar diagram there. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm alone in feeling this, that it's been 
more than difficult um, over the last year. There have been huge changes. We've lost some of the very best people too in our faculty, um, the, the research support staff, um, at least some of the ones that went were really uh, outstanding. And I raise it now because the thought that this should be centralized um, or, or run from a central operation is absolutely terrifying um, to me. Uh, but was, if you've got significant grant income from multiple sources, the rules vary from different agencies. And the key to the game is how you use the totality of your funding to achieve um, uh, uh, your research outputs. And that requires knowledge, insight, and flexibility and speed of reaction from somebody who's really up to speed and who works with you as part of a team. And I'm just, I'm terrified at what may be coming our way, um, given the pattern over the last year or two, um, to be quite blunt. And I would really like you to take on board um, colleagues uh, who've got experience of holding largish blocks of funding together so that you hear from the ground floor what it's like. Yeah, no, I, I, I do hear what you're saying, Andrew. I, I, the first thing I'd acknowledge is that in, in, um, in BMH, with the voluntary severance scheme, you know, the scheme was designed to ensure that we managed who left and how many left um, across the university with the intention of not having a, a significant negative impact on, on our operations. Uh, I'm not sure we... we always got that that right um, I do know there have been pressures in in BMH and I know that Vicky and David and other colleagues have been working hard to to, to try and mitigate the impact that there has been um, as I said earlier on it's it's been exacerbated because in the ideal world we wouldn't have done the VS scheme when we did it we would have we would have had that scheme as part of redesigning the technology and the processes so that you didn't see any reduction in, in support from PS colleagues. Um, and I also take your point, you know, I, 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 nobody's suggesting that we're going to centralize everything in our university. I know that seems to be a default position, but it's, I want us to get away from thinking about where people sit and think more about how services are delivered and how you engage with services. There's a lot more that we can be doing uh, digitally than we've done in the past. We spend a lot of time and effort doing transactional work that could be automated. Um, and that would free up resource, Andrew, to have more PS colleagues operating at a strategic planning level alongside you, knowing and understanding what you need and what you do. Um, and and where, where they sit, I don't think should be the issue. What's important is that they do have that ongoing relationship with with academic colleagues i'm not sure i swallow that um i i found the experience here pretty um uh, uh, less than easy over the last two three years not just the last year um there's a tendency increasingly to automate and dump stuff back onto the um lap of the um principal investigator uh, the amount of responsibility that individual colleagues now have to carry and the amount of documentation they have to cope with mm -hmm. is phenomenal and uh, at times one is met with I'm sorry to say a job's worth tick box attitude by people who have only just come into a job and may three months later have moved on to something else and it just drives you absolutely incandescent because you lose funds you can't support staff because you can't move funds flexibly and all the rest of it it's a real problem for those of us running large-ish mm -hmm. research groups it's it's not a trivial issue no, I, I, I understand that, and I, and I agree with that. I don't, I, I'm not suggesting it's not a risk or a problem. Um, when the steering group met recently, um, we actually spent quite a lot of time talking about avoiding the risk that you're describing, okay? We could, we could slim down professional services or change the way it operates substantially, but one of the impacts could be that all we do is transfer administrative work onto academic colleagues. That's a very real risk. And I, and I know that's happened in some cases in the past. I, I, I agree with that. We're very clear that we have to avoid doing that when we're reshaping PS. Um, that's, that will be a key 
factor when we look at how what the workload is and how we're going to manage that workload in the future. Um, uh, I'm not going to say it'll always be perfect. Um, we have some significant challenges that we that we have to address in our university in the way that we operate. Uh, we have to we're going to have to find new ways of doing things. But I would hope that we can still make sure we get the right balance between what you need to do as an academic colleague working alongside a professional services colleague. Otherwise, it'll be self-defeating. Thank you. Um, and thank you for um, going into extra time with us. Uh, we've got a couple. We, we've got one question and a comment. So, uh, David. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ian. Um, Patrick, uh, at risk of answering my own question, I was just going to comment back to um, to Andrew and say, I think um, my question was related to resource and how we how we balance resource and the day to day and um, with all the change projects that are coming. Um, uh, and that was a struggle before, Patrick, and I guess it's more of a struggle now that we've had the VS. And as you say, we probably didn't do the VS at the right time if we'd known the foresight. But I think in response to Andrew, if I may. I think there's a lot of activity that we ask our PS colleagues to do at the moment that probably doesn't add any value that we need to stop doing. Uh, and we're not helped sometimes by the lack of technologies that Patrick mentioned as well. So there's lots of handoffs in terms of processes and forms. And if we can get that better, it would actually free up our staff to do a lot more of the things that are important to you and give you that direct contact and, and the support that you need. But at the moment, we just don't have the mechanisms to do that in some places. So I'd probably answer my own question, Patrick, there to start to yeah. some degree. Um, and, and my last point was, uh, our last question was around, how do we manage those projects that they're, they're in sync? Um, because we sometimes have a lot of projects that pull people in different directions or, or compete with each other in terms of resource and timelines. So the way we're, we're doing that now is through the strategic change subcommittee um, that didn't exist previously. And it has full oversight across all of the change programs. Um, it's quite a difficult challenge. Uh, in some cases, it's, the problem is fixed by not having enough funding to invest in the change program, so we can't do as much as we might like. Uh, but that means we don't put pressure on the day-to-day -day business of the university whilst we're doing the change programs. But I, 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 we talked a lot about the student experience program in the last month or so, for example, and we took a difficult decision that if we were to delay it any further, the problems that we've had in coping with the workload since the BS scheme would only continue until such time as we complete SEP. So it made more sense to take the short-term pain of progressing SEP now and getting it completed so that we get to where we want to be more quickly than, than otherwise. Uh, but I, it's, not, it's, it's a difficult balance, um, particularly, you know, when our normal business operations, our normal academic operations, our normal activities are, are not normal anymore, frankly. Uh, and we don't know when we will get back to normality. So we do worry about that all the time at the Strategic Change Committee. Thank you. Um, Anne. And we can't hear you. There you go. It's following on quite nicely in the sense that I'm on the faculty committee too. And I would just like to stress, Patrick, that the academics have not really understood what's happening with the SEP. Um, we're very, very grateful to you for coming to the school board to talk about it, but it's putting huge pressure on PS staff. I've never seen so many stressed staff and um, I don't think the academics if you ask academics on the corridors they just don't understand what's going on and as Andrew said the academics just have to pick up a lot of the roles that our very very excellent PS staff were doing and we end up because we're the ones with residual knowledge because they've changed their jobs so many times. And 
um, it's really distressing because we're not getting things done. Um, and I think that um, the other thing that, you know, a very good example of it not working is the IT. Um, uh, they, I, I, I was at the stage trying to, to do uh, teach students and um, I couldn't find how to get to anyone to, in IT to ask them a question. They have hidden the way you can contact them so efficiently. I thought I would just phone Nancy and get her to tell me how to get in touch with someone. I was so stressed at trying to provide the students with answers. And I think it's, I mean, it's really good to talk, hear you talk about things and hear you talk about the balance of the issues. And we understand the need for the changes, but um, we're going backwards a bit, a lot. And um, so I hope that in coming to the school board, you can reflect this back. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Anne. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I hear, I hear what you say. Um, I struggle, I struggle with communications. Um, our university seems to be more complex than any institution I've ever been in. Com communication and engagement is always an issue. People say they don't know what's going on. They haven't had an opportunity to engage. They don't know how to get hold of someone. Um, and and I and I'm sure I'm sure that's right. But then on the other side of the coin, I look at all the information that we have on our intranet. There's a dedicated SEP site with a, a wealth of information in there um, for those who want to go and and look at it. Um, now we talked about this issue with the SEP board only yesterday, Anne. Um, with the SEP board as about half and half academic and, and PS colleagues, and you know, there, there were, there was a, there's, there's quite a big comms plan that's been developed to be rolled out as part of getting SEP going again. Um, but it is going to rely on leadership at all levels, engaging with the program, making it their business to find out what's going on and understand the program, and then communicate that to their teams. Mm. Um, we were asked, why isn't the programme team just going out and talking to colleagues? Why aren't they having open meetings? Um, but that's, that's no substitute for proper engagement by leaders at all levels of the university. Um, partly because it means the leaders, those leaders must take ownership of the programme as well. The SEP is not something being done to us by somebody else. It's our university programme. Um, and it's designed to deliver benefits for staff as well as students. So we... We all have a, a responsibility to engage with it. Um, and I, I'm sorry to hear about the IT issues. So I, if you want to talk to me about that separately, I'd be interested to try and understand that uh, because there are clear ways of getting hold of IT colleagues and they, they've had to step up in many cases in the last 10 months um, because we've, we've, we've um, come to rely on them even more than we ever did before. So if there's specific issues there, and I'm more than happy to, to talk to you about them to understand them better online so I can, I can pick them up. Uh, we've got a new director of ITS starting with us at the beginning of March, um, Claire Priestley, who uh, I think is going to be really successful in the role, will really engage with academic colleagues in the university and um, help transform our ITS services. Well, I'm very happy to take you through the process of trying to get to the right page. Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy. Give me, give me a shout. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so Danielle, um, as uh, unfortunately has had to leave because uh, she's got another, uh, another meeting to go to. So she'll come back at the next meeting. She says that she's happy to take any um, questions by email in the meantime. So we've got one more question for Patrick, if you'll, um, if you just hold on and then we'll go straight to uh, Dan George. So, um, Donald. Donald Ward. Yeah, hi, Patrick. I'll just read out my chat question. We're facing yeah. increase in, increasing instances of students selling or uploading lecture slides, exam papers uh, to places like Stu Docu, for example. 
my, it is my understanding that we can't do anything at school level unless there is a formal university policy and disciplinary procedure that would force students to remove them or stop them doing it. I just need to know, is that on your radar? Is anybody at university level discussing this? Uh, so, and the risk is that if I include copyright material on my notes, it's reasonably because it's internal and for educational purposes, if somebody then uploads that publicly, copyright is being breached and presumably the university is at risk. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of this as a general issue, um, particularly elsewhere in the sector, and we've seen what's happened elsewhere. Donald, would you do me a favour? Um, would you copy, I, mean, I, might I might be able to do it myself. I'm going to copy your, your note in the chat, and I'm going to pick it up um, with April and see whether TLG has been looking at this. Um, if not, I will make sure that we pick it up and come back to you. I'd be very grateful. I think it's just we would like to enforce it, but I, my understanding is that we can't unless it's a university-wide policy and wow. disciplinary procedure. In which case, we, we need to address the university-wide issue. Oh, Dan, hello, yeah, Dan. Yeah, um, just to yeah, just to add to that. Yes, yes, we are picking this up under um, blended learning because you can imagine it's um, there's sort of copyright potential issues, etc. So we're picking it up within then, and I can report back if that would be helpful. Oh, Dan, that's really kind of you. Thank, thank you. you Fantastic. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for spending this time with us. It was really useful. And um, I hope you I uh, hope you found it useful um, as well. Um, so you can hang around if you'd like or uh, we can say goodbye to you now. And we'll I, 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 yeah, I'll go. But oh. Ian, I, I, I am very happy to come back. Uh, I know we do this about once a year, but I, um, I'm always happy to come back and talk to you if you want me to at, at any time. Fantastic. Thank well, you thank all you. very much for your time today. Bye bye. OK, thank you. Right, so um, I apparently misspoke. I think I, I, I claimed that somebody else had left the building. In fact, it's um, the virtual building. It was Gabrielle Finn who had to move on. So we're gonna invite her back um, next time. And um, so next up is Dan George. So. Hello, um, can you see my slides okay? Yes, I Marvelous. can. Marvellous, all right, thank you. Thanks very much for um, for allowing me to, to get crash your um, your school board. Um, I'm um, Dan George. I'm the Associate Vice President for Blended and Flexible Learning. I actually took this role in July uh, last year, which is a very interesting time to take over anything to do with blended learning. Um, but I'd just like to, to go through um, some, some stuff we've, we've already done, the idea about a strategy going forward, and, and more importantly, how, how to make sure I engage really well with the faculty as a whole, but, but your school in particular as well. So, so any and all ideas on, on how best to engage with you and make sure um, I'm capturing everybody's um, comments and ideas will be very welcome. Thanks. Um, just to very briefly, blended learning, I know many of us on the call will, will know what this is. Um, I think it's, it's important to make the distinction between sort of what, what we've been doing in, in the past almost a year now. Um, and you know, quite a lot of that has been online and, and much more online than, than perhaps many of us would want. You know, we'd want that sort of face-to-face -face still as well. So, so when I'm talking about blended learning, I'm talking about a true strategic approach to blended learning rather than the sort of emergency situation we're in at the moment. Um, in terms of our plan for, for what we want to do, um, I want to try and introduce a, a very coordinated approach to, to blended learning across the, the university. It needs to be accessible, inclusive, and it needs to be international. Um, and, and this isn't uh, just for our, um, our on-campus students. This is for our distance learning students, degree apprenticeships, um, possibly CPD, et cetera. So, so um, all of our, our student body, uh, not just the on-campus on ones as well. Um, I think we've we've learned a huge amount uh, from from the past couple of semesters on um, on on how to to approach blended learning and how not to approach it as well. Uh, we've done lots in terms of technology content and and guidance, um, and I can go through that in in a bit more detail another day if, if that would be useful. Um, I've tried to rag rate uh, what what we've done from a blended learning point of view and what we're good at and, and what we're bad at, and and again I, I'm happy to to share that if if that would be useful. 
Um, in terms of what's in scope of what we're now calling the flexible learning program, um, there, hopefully you can see on your screen, uh, and, and I can share these slides because I know there's a lot of text on these. Um, we've tried to sort of break it up um, with, um, with in what's in scope from a technology point of view, what's in scope from uh, governance skills structure um, from our students. And then also we have a, a block on what maybe is in scope as well. And, and that will be part of the, the scoping exercise to, to make sure, you know, are these things in scope or not? So things like MOOCs, are MOOCs in scope? Is CPD um, in scope of the, um, the uh, program and where, where does provision for PGR students as an example or MRED students does that sit within this or is that sitting outside of it as well um, you'll see there's um, the the role of UMW that's one thing I'm going to come back to um, in a few minutes it's an Im important thing for us to get right as well and I know there's a huge amount of work in your faculty uh, uh, within distance learning as well um, okay, so so strategy considerations. I, I have at the moment. I sort of have more more questions uh, than answers at the moment. This is we are at the, the sort of very very embryonic stages of this program. This program is going to be a, a three and a half year program. So so it was in our our, our five year strategy anyway, the our future strategy anyway. Um, but but I think it would be really good to try and capitalize on some of the amazing work that's happened over the past year and and continue um, to build on it not in a, such an accelerated um, uh, speed but but certainly build on all of the good stuff that's happened but we need to understand what good blended or flexible learning looks like um, and and make sure that that we have the the infrastructure the systems the processes etc um, that, that we'll need to, to support blended learning um, in the future as well. Um, so, so like I say, a lot more questions and answers at the moment, but from my point of view, the support is absolutely key for this move. I think we need to acknowledge that, that the upfront, there is upfront workload to, to changing the way you might be teaching now um, and, um, and to move towards more blended learning we must have an army of support for people if we want people to do this. So learning technologists and structural designers, academic support in terms of GTAs. Um, I'm, I'm talking to HR at the moment about sort of a, almost like a super GTA role, um, uh, what I'm calling an associate lecturer role. It's something that the Open University have a lot to support their blended learning uh, or on, online learning. Um, and, and just seeing if we, if such a role could exist for us at Manchester as well. But again, I'd love to hear, would that be a good thing or not um, in here? So, so like I say, lots of, lots of questions, not very many answers at the moment. Um, in terms of where I am with the strategy, like I say, I, this has just started. Um, we have three and a half years to deliver this. I have until um, summertime, hopefully late summer, to, to develop the full strategy um, paperwork and to submit that to, to the appropriate governance structure in the university. So I just wanna sort of briefly take you through where my thoughts are at the minute. None of this is finished. This is very much just throwing ideas at the minute. Um, and so, so I very much value your, your input and ideas on what's missing, uh, what shouldn't be there, et cetera. So, um, but, but the idea is I want to try and sort of draw a bit of a hive diagram um, with flexible in the middle. And when I say flexible, really I'm talking about different pathways. So the sort of our um, traditional degrees, you know, three, four years, um, short degrees. Do we want to do micro credits? Um, what do we want to do with degree apprenticeships? Um, what about our um, UMW and the international centers, et cetera? Then there's a whole bunch of stuff on partnerships um, and this will be done in collaboration with Judy Williams, who, who is the uh, AVP um, for inclusivity as well. So, so looking at sort of students as partners, the co-creation um, and how we work in partnership as well with um, staff 
students and then external stakeholders as well. Of course, there is a massive digital part to this. And um, um, I'm very pleased to say uh, Steve Pettifer, uh, who is a prof in computer science, he is taking the academic lead as the head of digital learning for the university. And he's gonna lead part of this for me. Um, but, but again, ideas that we've had so far is around the digital learning environment, um, you know, Blackboard, et cetera. Are these fit for purpose? Do we need to be changing these going forward? Um, what do we want to do with the digital literacy of both our students and our staff? And what's that student journey look like um, from a digital perspective? Um, and then sort of lots of other things around the, the um, peripheral that I'm not quite sure what to do with yet, but I know they're really, really important. So how do we engage with IT services? Um, what policies do we need? Um, uh, how do we engage with the English Language Centre? You know, things like that in the library. Um, but that's just sort of a bit of a dump of, of ideas so far. Um, and like I say, I'd love to love to hear what your what your thoughts are for this and I can send the slides. Um, what's currently underway right now, uh, we're doing a, a review of UMW. This is absolutely a, a grassroots review of University of Manchester worldwide. So our, our transnational education or distance learning programs. Um, do we need something at the center um, that supports the, the faculties? Can the faculties just do it on their own? Um, if we do have something at the center, what does it look like? How is it going to service what faculties need, et cetera? I think it's fair to say that there's, there's probably quite a lot of work that needs to be done there, um, given the, the current relationships and the breakdown of relationships between uh, faculties and um, the UMW center as well. Um, there is what was called the e-learning review. So previously under the SEP, um, it was called e-learning review. Um, the, a review, when, when you're talking about staff, um, makes people feel very nervous, which I understand. And, and this isn't about getting rid of staff. What I want to do is, is look at the e-learning teams across the three faculties and the e-learning team that sits in the center under Ian Hutt. And, and look at, do we have enough people? Because we're definitely not, not getting rid of the roles. If anything, we need more. Um, and uh, under my program, we've, we've bolstered it by 10% um, e-learning technologists in the past few months, but is that enough? Do we need more? I guess, you know, my initial feeling is we do need more but we'll see. So there will be um, a review that's much more around how are the teams working together, um, pulling them together a bit more to, to make sure that we facilitate um, and, and help the areas that need help um, across, the, across the university as well. Um, then we also have an approach to blended learning from, from next academic year. Hopefully it's next academic year. It certainly has to be post COVID. So, um, so like I say, this is much more strategic approach towards blended learning. There is a discussion paper, uh, which I sent Tony uh, earlier this, this week um, and all heads of school across the, uh, across the university, just to try and input into that discussion paper. It will be a discussion paper that will, I'm trying to get it to a Senate briefing first as a discussion paper, and then it will go to Senate um, as a proposal as well. And uh, the sort of highlights for that really is, is looking at the, the synchronous activities, what we should use synchronous activities for. So those sort of live on campus, face-to-face -face, um, activities, workshop seminars, tutorials, labs, you know, example classes, ex field work, practical activities, et cetera. Um, and, and then what we do with the sort of non-interactive explanatory materials. So should we keep them asynchronous, so keep them as videos, um, rather than have that sort of non-interactive didactic form of, of teaching and have that as a default as well. So, so you'll see that um, in that discussion paper as well. Um, but, but in terms of um, what I'd really like to, to get your input from is, what is it that you'd want to see from, from a flexible learning program, blended learning provision going forward? Um, what, do we, what would work for your school? Um, and then crucially how to engage with your school as well and make sure that I am capturing 
um, people's comments, suggestions, ideas um, at a really, really early stage so we can write them into, into, the, um, into the strategy. Okay, I will stop sharing. Thanks very much, everyone. Well, thank you um, very much, uh, Dan. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. I mean, I can I can fill time uh, while people are thinking about things. Uh, just that last point about um, about the the fate of non interactive um, delivery. Um, I mean, pre COVID, as I recall, we were all sort of told that there was no such thing as non interactive. Um, delivery that, you know, the traditional lecture in which uh, a lecturer just gave up and sort of spewed out material is dead and that our lectures need to be more flexible and dynamic and interactive. So are you now going back to the old model and kind of um, sort of repackaging um, as a good uh, non-interactive learning? No, I mean, I, I think um, if there are lectures that are interactive and you know you might you might sort of talk for 15 minutes and then there's something interactive that you're doing with the students then I think that's great so I'm, I'm not saying we need to get rid of that what what I'd like to move away from is that sort of maybe 50 minutes of me standing at the front and giving that material which is really important material and I need to deliver it but I deliver it in a way that you know my 250 students just sit and listen to me for 50 minutes. Um, if that's the case, what I need to do or what I want to do is, is chop up that material, that really important information into maybe 15 minute videos or you know whatever, and then give that to the students and say, okay, listen to that, watch that um, anytime, anywhere with whoever you want. We can watch it together if you want. Um, you can watch it as many times as you want. And then when we come together in a live environment, we can talk about maybe problems to do, you know, do like flip the classroom and, and do problem solving. We could go into the lab more instead and, and do more practical work. I'm from the School of Engineering. So my, my subject's very practical um, and whatever's sort of appropriate, but it's much more about that sort of non-interactive material that is delivered and has to be delivered, you know, the information has to be given. Um, let's put that online or let's deliver that asynchronously and all of the great interactive stuff that we all do, let's make sure that's the on-campus face-to-face. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I do have a question, which I'm not really sure with this is um, in your remit, but maybe we'll transition to uh, the general open Q&A. And Dan, if you can hang on, because you may have something to say about this first question that I've been, um, I uh, have received um, sort of offline. So it's a question about how it is that, um, um, that in the, current kind of um, context, program directors have had to be, um, have, have been asked to do um, what they, what, you know, what, what many would uh, sort of consider to be um, an impossible job. So the question is, does SLT uh, appreciate the frustration on the part of program directors who have been asked to make decisions about the delivery of teaching and to communicate this to students with less than a day's notice. What can be done in future to ensure that staff have adequate time to consult colleagues and reach an informed decision on issues such as this? So I don't know, Dan, whether you have anything to say. I mean, obviously that's something for Tony, but maybe for Carol and Nick and Felicity to comment on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, from my point of view, I, I'm not on SLT, April McMahon, who is my sort of boss, the, the vice president obviously is, um, but, but I'm on her, her teaching and learning group executive as is Gabrielle. Um, and, um, and I guess what I'd say is the, the lack of time between, you know, having to make a decision and, and getting the comms out has been tiny already. So it's, so it's not like, I don't think anyone's sort of sitting 
on a communication and then <laughs> giving enough people time. It's just been so rapid, the, the, the change over the past few months. Um, we've all had to do, you know, make decisions really, really quickly. Um, and, and so I, I absolutely sympathize with the program directors. Um, but, but I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the SLT would say, but certainly from my point of view, we've just had to make decisions so, so quickly that there hasn't been another option other than to make that decision quickly, get it out to program directors as quickly as we can. And then, you know, they have to deliver that as quickly as they can. Um, I'd love to have been able to have more time, but given the, the challenges we've, we're facing at the minute, we just don't have that luxury. Carol, you want it in on this? Sure, um, I'd, I'd echo what Dan's saying there. We've, we have had very short timelines to work to and the messages that I've been sending out, Lindsay's been sending out to programme directors for the communications, we've only received the day that we've sent them to everybody else. Um, what we've tried to do is support our programmes to implement holding emails so that it gives them a little more time to, to consider what's being done. Um, and that's worked to a certain extent. I think we're getting to a position now where things are becoming a little more, I don't want to use the word controlled, <laughs> but uh, we understand a little more how to manage these things. And that's, I think that's been the biggest difficulty is just knowing how to manage the situation that we're currently in. And, but more importantly, communicating to the students. And because there's been some very major decisions that we've had to make, and communicate to the students, the implications for them are enormous and for us as well. And that's been the difficulty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, I do sympathize with everybody on this one, <laughs> um, but it's from both directions as well. So uh, yeah, that's my view anyway. <laughs> right, so I mean, it, it, I, I'm not sure that the question actually was, um, was a sort of a criticism of the local, but it was actually sort of, I, I suppose, more that you are dealing with impossibly tight um, um, uh, turnaround times. And obviously you have to pass them on to, uh, you know, down the chain. But the, the, the question is how we can ensure that there is kind of more headroom um, once a central directive comes down and feeds down to local levels. I don't know, Tony, do you have, I'm, uh, do well, you have anything I, I, to I mean, add to that? Uh, I'm, I have every sympathy with the staff because I'm a member of staff and I've tried to communicate that in all my, my um, letters and, and, and news items to the school. It's not as a result of the senior leadership team, and we can all have our views about the senior leadership team, it's as a result of external advice that we receive from central government and from educational agencies controlled by central government. And so we might think we've got the, the cutting edge policy um, right, and then it's changed at the drop of a hat. So uh, we are actually, in charge of the ship uh, to um, control it. I think <clears throat> all I can say is that program directors, like everybody that's been involved in delivering teaching, have been absolutely fantastic. And I know everybody's exhausted and I know everybody's a bit fed up, but we have delivered uh, and uh, we have courses running and the university is open for business. You might define or ask me to define what open for business is, but we are working. Um, and it's due entirely to the wonderful efforts of our staff. It's as simple as that. I don't think that we can actually become masters of our own destiny in this context. I, I mean, we are forever going to be um, at the mercy of policy, which is largely dictated on the hoof by our, our government for good or ill. So without going into politics, uh, and questioning the intelligence quotient of the people that control our government, uh, one has to say that we're doing the very best that we can. Um, and um, uh, in spite of our government, rather than as a result of our government. 
Right. So that's a clear school um, steer from head of school um, about how to how to approach the next uh, the next balloting. Uh, <laughs> OK, um, thank you. Thank you for that. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. I was trying to be apolitical, but now you've done it. <laughs> OK, um, so there are no other um, questions for Dan. So Dan, you can hang around if you'd like, or thank you very much for um, sharing that. I'm sorry that we were uh, running a bit late. Um, and if, yes, if you'll share those slides and we'll, we'll see how it is that we can feedback um, thoughts. That's great. All right, thanks very much. Thank, thank you, bye. Thank you. So we have about um, 15 minutes left before the meeting um, closes. Uh, I don't see any hands. I mean, I, I only have a small screen here, so I don't see any hands up. Jenny, are there any? <coughs> no? Okay, well, I've got a few things to say, <laughs> to say in closing and, you know, raise your hands um, if, there's, if there's anything more uh, that you want to, uh, to, uh, to say. So I said that we had a few um, communications between the last board and this one. Um, which didn't actually go, I mean, yeah. Um, so I thought that I would just kind of go through those um, and then maybe um, end with a uh, kind of solicitation for more. So we did get a question uh, about the processes and whether we could review the processes for purchasing goods and services to simplify them if possible. So the question reads currently, um, and then this is a quote, this is, I guess, the quote from the, um, from the current guidelines or the guidelines back then, only essential services and supplies can be purchased during the closure of university buildings and non-essential services. Only essential purchases which have been approved by a member of SLT or one of their delegates will be processed. So the questioner then uh, comments, I understand why these restrictions were put in place and that they have to be done, had to be done quickly but they are making ordering even basic essentials incredibly time consuming, as it's looking like we may be in the situation for some time to come. And that's prescient from the point of view of October. Please, can we have this process reviewed? Now, um, there, this, as I understand it, this has been reviewed and there was a, it was discussed at a recent um, faculty SLT meeting. Um, Tony, you can come in on this where, our head of faculty finance reported that the current system needed to remain in place for now. There is a statement that is attached to that, which I don't think I'll go in with, uh, but you can guess what it says. It's like, you know, we need to make sure that we um, keep control over um, our, 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 our finances. And unfortunately, uh, we can't change the way that we're doing right now. But before Christmas, we added two people from each school to the return to campus register to support low value BAU teaching spend to alleviate some of the administrative burden. So that I suppose goes part ways towards some kind of loosening up of the system. But Tony, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the faculty, actually responded to that issue and, and wanted to, to actually um, take the break off ordering and the approval of finance. And that was actually agreed at faculty leadership team, but it was again reversed by the senior leadership team of the university um, against the background of this lockdown. Um, there are reservations about the number of overseas students who may return at the end of the month and pay their fees. And as Patrick was alluding, um, there is an issue about rent rebates and possibly fee rebates. So um, the university got very nervous about the financial situation, which was beginning to look um, a little healthier uh, towards the um, Christmas period. So that's the reason, um, and I, I mean, I've, I'm just as frustrated as everybody else. Um, uh, Jenny and I have to approve um, uh, expenditure, which can be five pounds to 155,000 pounds. And, and we have to sign every single one off. And I have complained repeatedly. Uh, and I think that Sinead and Vicky Goddard at faculty level are also fed up with all the paperwork. 
but at the moment that's the situation uh, and I can't see it changing for another month or so but we may have a clearer picture by the end of January and into February and maybe there will be a move towards a more flexible way of financing sign off at that time uh, and that's about all I can say at this moment but I am entirely in sympathy with the questioner no no doubt about that <laughs> You are, after all, one of us. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> absolutely right. And I would like to point out that I get it both ways. I get it from the students and the staff and the senior leadership team. Right. Well, that's why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> what bucks? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, there's another uh, 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 another, <laughs> another thing that, that, uh, that we received very recently. On the 12th of January, I received a message from a member of the um, faculty board, which forwarded on a suggestion that a motion be debated and voted on at the next school board. In other words, today, so two days ago, we got this. So the motion related to um, questions about university uh, governance and, ma and, and management. So there was obviously no time to work um, uh, this into today's uh, meeting, but I am very happy to, um, to be involved with, to discuss with anybody that wants to sort of raise this at the next board meeting. Uh, and we can, we, can, we can figure out how it is that we can work into the agenda, what kind of um, paperwork needs to be pre-circulated at a timely fashion in order for when we come back um, in our next meeting, which is Tuesday, March 20th, 10 a.m., Jenny tells me, uh, we can actually have a proper discussion, an informed discussion. People will have read uh, the material in advance and will become ready to, um, to discuss. So again, I'm, uh, I, I reach out to members of the faculty board who want to kind of liaise with me on this and indeed any other interested member of the school board uh, who wants to, to, to join that. Um, so that's an invitation and, and again, the new, um, school board uh, website, which should be up very shortly, will have the documentation uh, that is that is needed in order to sort of begin that process. But again, you can just get in touch with me informally and we can we can go for there. So if that's um, if there's no other um, questions, I don't see any other questions. Uh, it just leaves me to thank you all for what's actually been a really, uh, I think, useful and quite interesting and quite a spirited uh, discussion. Uh, I look forward to more. So um, again, between now and, and, and March, please feel free to get in touch with me and Jenny if you want to um, discuss the possibility of raising any matters in the next uh, meeting. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you all well, safety, um, and some sort of degree of sanity as we approach um, um, COVID lockdown teaching mark two. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.